My name is Jessie Herman, and I'm the Director of Programs and Community Outreach at the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. Thank you for joining us today for this critically important documentary screening and conversation. We would also like to thank our program partners, the World Affairs Councils of America, Vulcan Productions, Spin Film, Riot Films, and MTV Documentary Films. We have an incredibly diverse audience watching today from countries around the world. We would like to especially welcome the students we have participating, as well as attendees from the World Affairs Councils across the entire nation. The World Affairs Council of Charlotte in North Carolina is leading nonprofit, nonpartisan organization work, and we're committed to bringing the world to Charlotte. We do this through a variety of programs that work to build an engaged and internationally informed community. I encourage you to explore our upcoming programs and different membership opportunities by checking out our website or different social media channels. You can also learn more about the World Affairs Council's network and find nearby councils at worldaffairscouncils.org. So let's get to the discussion that we're all here for. You've just watched the documentary and I'm sure we all have questions about the film, the humanitarian crisis and what we can do. Today's conversation will be with experts Nicholas Kristoff, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist with the New York Times, and Sky Fitzgerald, the twice Oscar nominated director of Hunger Ward. And their full biographies will be posted in the chat box for you. And now we're going to start with a message from Yemen from Dr. Aida El Sadiq, who was featured in Hunger Ward. I'm Dr. Aida Hassan Sadiq. Thank you for coming to this Hunger World event. This film is my story, and also it's the story of far too many Yemeni people. It documents what I, my fellow doctors, nurses, and 16 million mothers, fathers, children are suffering since 2015 of human need, food shortage because of war and blockade. The children I treat often travel hundreds of kilometers simply to, for a chance to survive. Some respond to treatment and try journey back home. Others are not so fortunate. I believe in hope and I dedicated my life for research and management of civil Emanuel children. As Yemen faces the world worst famine in modern history, my hope is in humanity, in your humanity. Please stand by us. Ask your government to stop supporting this war against Yemenis. My country turn it to be unsafe and unhealthy. This is not the country we deserve to live in. Kai, I'm proud to have partnered with you and spin film on this collaborative film. I realized that you wanted to reveal the truth. It's real. Thank you and best of luck and good wishes. And thank you for your attendance. Hi, Nick. Hey, Sky. Hey, I really uh, thanks a bunch for um, engaging this conversation. I have to tell you, just on the front end of this, that um, your uh, your consistent work on Yemen over the years has really influenced my own. So, in particular, your you, you, the trip that you took in the fall of 2018, where you wrote a number of columns, um, one of them even covering Sadaka Hospital where we filmed really impacted me uh, as a human being and as a filmmaker and influenced my choice to sort of uh, film in that facility. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for that uh, because um, I think um, we all influence each other's focus and work and you certainly have in this case. Well, you, uh, <laughs> you, you repaid any debt by producing a really important and, and fantastic film that I hope gets traction at a really important time for Yemen. Um, 
I think there is some real chance now that we can end the war that causes this kind of problem. And that's going to come if there is sustained attention in the US and around the world. You know, it deserves it as well, but I think it, but that process also starts conversations, gets people moving. Yeah, yeah. So you, um, you've had a chance to see the film now, obviously. I, I'm curious, you know, having worked in that same facility as a, as a journalist in, in Sadaka Hospital with Aida, who we just saw, um, you know, how does that, uh, how does that feel for you to sort of see her both in the film through a different lens than you experienced her, right? Um, and also now, you know, two years later after you worked with her, seeing her sort of, I, th I think, communicate the same message in some ways, right? Is that um, this is still ongoing, her work still continues because the, the, the geopolitics of, of the conflict haven't been resolved. Um, so I'm just curious about your reaction to, to, to all of that. I mean, Sky, that's what's so painful that those scenes could have been done, you know, when I was there, they could have been done a year or two earlier, they could be done, you know, next month. And it was wrenching for me to be in that hospital for, you know, just a couple of days. You were there longer and, you know, it was wrenching for you. And poor Dr. Ida, I mean, she's there day in, day out. Uh, and watching kids die and starve to death is just a wrenching position for any human being, um, especially when it's preventable like that. So, boy, what a soul she is. What a courageous, yeah. Yeah. You know, incredible woman she is. And, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad you paid tribute to, to her fortitude. Yeah, and I think fortitude is such a great word to describe the strength that, that she needs and Makia needs to, um, to sort of do the work they do, right, which, which you witnessed firsthand. You know, um, one, one, of the, one of the things that I thought about when I was there filming was, you know, is, is this work that she's doing uh, Sisyphean in nature, right? Is, is it rolling that rock up the hill <laughs> over and over again, or, or is there you know, is, is the work that she's doing somehow intervening um, in a way that will enact change over time? And I think that's, a, that's, I guess, a dual question I'd like to pose. You know, as a photojournalist, you, you continue to intervene in this conflict in your, with your own tool set, right? Over and over again for years. Um, and I understand that you, you had traveled to Yemen long before the war began. Um, We've tried with this film, of course, to use it as a vehicle, right? A vehicle to raise awareness um, and also to try to push, you know, uh, at least the Biden administration to act more forcefully uh, with the geopolitical stance. Um, you know, how do you, what do you feel like the most effective approach could be for the fourth estate right now in particular to, to intervene in the, the, the conflict and the U.S. involvement in the conflict? Um, you know, it's simply a matter of providing coverage. And Yemen just has not been covered in the U.S. media with, you know, with some exceptions. The New York Times has done some, uh, you know, but TV, you know, think about when the last time yeah. CNN or MSNBC or Fox News uh, uh, covered Yemen. And that is partly because the Saudis and the Emiratis have placed obstacles and made it very difficult to report from uh, Yemen. But, you know, if Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt were fighting in Yemen, the press would figure out ways of getting there. And the fact that the press doesn't try as hard to cover the world's worst humanitarian crisis, I think, is a failure on our part in the media. And one of the things I've learned in my career is that when problems are invisible, when they don't get attention, they don't get resolved. And, um, you know, what we in the media can do is shine a relentless spotlight on these problems. And that's what you've done here. And that, you know, it, it doesn't solve the problem, 
but it creates political pressure on the Saudis, on the Emiratis, on the U.S. to put pressure on them, uh, hopefully on the Houthis as well, uh, to, you know, because at the end of the day, what Dr. Aida is doing is saving lives, but the real way to save lives is to stop the war. And, um, you know, she, that's, the, that's the intervention that we need more than emergency feeding packets. Um, and yet that is what, after six years, what we don't have. Yeah, you remind me of David Miliband's quote that, that, that he did a couple of years ago about, you know, uh, NGOs can, can save the dying, that can save the dying, but politics have to stop the killing. You know, I think yeah. that's so true. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, yeah. Sky, when I was watching it, I was, um, I was wondering about the logistics of you covering it because, um, you know, I found, I mean, I found it such a difficult place to, to get there, um, partly because of the, the visa issue. Um, and then it was also, frankly, a scary place. Um, I, I thought Aiden in particular was just kind of, you know, I, I kept thinking, as all these people were walking around with guns, that if you know if you have any sense, you're just going to kidnap me and hold me for ransom. <laughs> and I was hoping that none of them had the same idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Logistics were so difficult for us as well. I mean, I, I read in one of your columns, I, maybe it was one of the 2018 ones, that it took you two years to get your visas. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so now I feel really good because it only took us eight and a half months. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we got really lucky and we got, did you get one visa or did you travel solo? Um, uh, I, I just had the one visa. Yeah. Yeah. And we had asked for two and then after eight and a half months, they, they sent me one <laughs> and I oh. said to them, well, actually I can't, I, even though we'd requested two, I can't really do this film with all this equipment all by myself. Right. Yeah. So they, they thankfully were, were giving us another one, but you know, to your point about aid and, um, I, I concur completely, like for us, at least just from a security standpoint, that was absolutely um, the, the area when we were operating in and out of Sadaka on a regular basis where security felt like at any moment it could completely collapse, right? right. I mean, someone could grab you off the street and you, you might just disappear, right? Right. And um, that's a, you know, that's a psychological pressure, right? That's sort of consistent. Did you feel differently? When you then traveled to the north to the Houthi held area, you know, yeah, in the in the Houthi areas, um, and you know, for those who don't know the geography, so Maybe we should the, unpack that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so um, the traditional capital of Yemen has been Sanaa in the north, and that is controlled by the Houthis, who were called the rebels, even though they're controlling much of the country, um, and then the. Uh, then Aden in the south uh, is nominally controlled by this exile government that the outside world mostly recognizes. But in fact, that government really doesn't control anything at all. And that's why it's just, uh, you know, it's kind of a no man's land. Um, and so uh, when I was in the north in Sanaa, I felt much more secure because the Houthis, you know, they're incredibly repressive. Uh, they're they can be quite brutal, but they do have control. And I didn't feel like I was going to run into a checkpoint and just be grabbed by somebody and sold to Al Qaeda. Uh, and whereas I thought that that was a risk in the South. And in the North, there is some risk that, you know, a U.S. manufactured bomb will be dropped on me, uh, you know, by the Saudis. And it would be, um, it certainly be unpleasant to be killed by a bomb that my own tax dollars had paid for. Um, but, you know, I figured that was a pretty unlikely event and that at the end of the day, it was strongly in the Houthis' interest to make sure that I got out alive and mm -hmm. um, that they would not probably do anything untoward uh, to me. So I felt, I felt pretty relaxed going around uh, Sana'a in the north. Um, or at least comparatively relaxed. Well, I was, uh, uh, I was pretty jumpy uh, traveling around the South. Yeah, yeah, we we had we had the same experience for sure. Um, so you know, one of the one of the things that that I think um, really 
fascinates me is is you know um, this you know the 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 famine and and I call it a famine despite the metrics not consistently matching the UN mandate for it because I don't feel like they have enough data to make that determination frankly but I saw pockets of famine for sure throughout our time there but you know this famine as you know is human caused right which is just so fundamentally uh, gut wrenching if if you see in person what what that means in practical terms and and you know I I think back sometimes to uh, to 1994 Rwanda, right, where the genocide began and um, the world sort of paused or hesitated and didn't intervene in a significant way in any time to really avert, you know, a genocide. And, and there was, you know, I think to some extent it was because there was uncertainty about what was happening, what was unfolding. For me, you know, you've reported so consistently, you know, Lindsay Adario has reported consistently, Giles Clark, many others have gotten in um, and shown, you know, without a question that there is a human caused famine ongoing in the country for years now, and that our own government is complicit in that. And yet we haven't had the political will to stop that. And, you know, my take is that we're going to, you know, history is not going to shine a pretty light on that five years from now, 10 years from now. I'm curious how you see the fact that um, so many people have reported on this so well for a long period of time, and yet the geopolitics haven't yet resolved themselves to end such a horrible thing, the fact that there's a famine going on that we can prevent. You know, it's... Um... It's wrenching and it's a political failure, but at some level, it's also, I think, a media failure because we've both seen that when there is enough media coverage about something, that does create the political will to address it. Um, so, you know, again, just to give a little background for those not steeped in the politics of Yemen. Um, so, look, Yemen has always been a, a poor country and there's always been malnutrition in Yemen, but what really dramatically worsened things was that the uh, the current crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, back when he was defense minister, a newly appointed defense minister uh, in 2015, uh, he, I think he wanted to flex his muscles to show he was a serious player, uh, to show his expertise in the military. Uh, and he uh, launched an attack on the Houthis and the Houthis had indeed behaved irresponsibly in Yemen. So, uh, so he launched an attack on them, and he thought this would be something that would be over in in a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. Um, the uh, U.S. Uh, initially, this is under President Obama, assented because at that point they needed Saudi support or they wanted Saudi support to work out their Iran deal, um, and. Uh, then instead of it being over in a couple of months and the Houthis being pushed out, in fact, uh, it just dragged on and, you know, thousands have been uh, killed by bombs, by U.S. made bombs. But even more than that, the quarantine uh, has meant that uh, food isn't enough, not enough food is going in, not enough uh, petrol and other supplies are going in, that fishermen aren't allowed to go out to sea to catch fish. Uh, and so kids starve to death. And um, as you say, you know, this, this is a human caused uh, starvation. And so um, if that quarantine were lifted, and people were allowed to travel freely, then, um, uh, you know, there would still be malnutrition. There would still be problems. It'd still be a poor place, but uh, it would be far, far better off than it is now. And meanwhile, that, you know, that military incursion, instead of showing the wisdom of MBS, it simply showed Saudi weakness. Uh, it uh, empowered Al-Qaeda. Uh, in the area. There's an Al-Qaeda affiliate there. Uh, it has led to the fragmentation of Yemen into all kinds of little local factions. It's been disastrous for security. It's been disastrous for everybody, uh, but mostly disastrous for Yemeni children. 80% of the country now relies on, on food aid. Yeah, yeah, which is just a horrific fact.
So, you know, we're, we're kind of doing the very thing that, that I didn't do in the film, right? Now, now, now that you've seen it, is that um, the intent with the film really was to really just show that the, the human impact of the conflict, because as a storyteller, I felt that's, that's one way that, that film could sort of differentiate itself a little bit was to, to speak through images, to speak to the heart directly in the, in the hopes that it would, it would, you know, it would spark the intellect and people would be curious to want to know more. Um, so now that you've seen the film, uh, which is, you know, a completely different medium that, that you work in, can, can you just share with me sort of your reaction to sort of seeing the same story that you experienced yourself, but in a different medium, right? Because that must have been different for you. It's literally a different lens, right? To, to experience the same hospital. Yeah, it is. And um, just the raw emotional power of, um, you know, families seeing their kids struggling for life and then in some cases dying, that just, you know, that just gets you. It wrenches, uh, it wrenches you. And um, of course, you know, starvation indeed, when it kills, it mostly kills kids. Um, kids are more vulnerable to starvation than older people. Um, and, um, you know, I found it very, very painful to be there and to see that. And uh, then watching the film, it brought back that flood of, flood of emotions. And also just this frustration that we haven't, um, that we haven't acted more aggressively to, to stop it. And, you know, this, this is a bipartisan failure. This was the, uh, this was Democrats under Obama and Republicans under Trump who both dropped the ball on this. And, um, and it's Europeans as well. Um, and um, it's not, you know, it's, diplomacy is hard. I recognize it's easy for us to say, you know, so it's, it's hard, but um, I don't think that American officials, or European officials um, have pushed as hard as they could. And I think they've pulled back partly originally because they, because of the Iran deal. And now again, perhaps because the Biden administration wants to rejoin the, the, uh, the Iran deal. Uh, so I think, you know, politics are again, getting in the way of saving lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I was, I was concerned about, um, that I, that I tried to seek out in, in Hunger Ward in the film, I, I was just concerned that, you know, we, you never know what you're going to discover in the course of filming, right? Um, you know, you kind of, um, have to just respond to what happens to some extent, because this wasn't a film that we in any way set up, right? Uh, we simply tried to be as observational as possible um, and then pivoted into events as they occurred. But even within sort of that, that broader context, I was always looking for, for hope. I was always looking for moments where I felt like hope could mediate this really difficult context and environment and set of challenges that both Makia and Aida was working in. So it's, you know, it's why, it's why, you know, in the film, there's, there's the shot of, of Makia, the 10 year old girl, right, giving the cup full of water to the younger child, because I, I found that moment so beautiful. And, and I felt like it was really important to try to showcase those when they happen, because, you know, they do, if we look for them. And, and that was, sort of I look for small moments like that throughout. As a journalist, having covered this for so long, what what gives you hope in this conflict or or in the current geopolitical dynamics or, or do you see any? So I guess I'd answer that in two ways. Two things give me hope, uh, Sky. One is and you know that we tend to cover the the horrible things, but side by side with the worst of humanity you tend to find the best. And yeah. so in Yemen, you've got warlords who are raping and slaughtering and torturing. Uh, you've also got people like, you know, like Dr. Aida who are risking their lives and 
uh, staying there and, and saving lives day in, day out. And so many aid workers who were going out and vaccinating kids, providing emergency feeding. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, in the US, we're not tested in the same way. Yemenis are tested. Some behave disastrously. Some behave with enormous courage and strength and decency and, and, and uh, almost saintly qualities. Yeah. And I guess the other thing that gives me hope is some of the background numbers. You know, in 1960, uh, 20 million kids a year uh, died uh, before the age of five. Uh, by 1990, it was down to 10 million. Down, now we're down to about 5 million. And so the kind of scenes that you captured in that hospital, um, they are fewer than they would have been in the past. And um, that horror of you know, a parent losing a child is indeed becoming more rare. Uh, historically, almost half of kids died uh, as children. Now it's down to 4%. Um, so that should, I think, be a, not, you know, not a reason for complacency, but rather a spur to, uh, to address it uh, and you know, do what we can in places uh, like, like Yemen. Now I'm curious what the reaction um, to, to that has been here in the US, have you, you know, do you get people who just say, oh, Yemen, long way away, I don't really care about what's, what's happening there, we gotta solve our own problems first? Or do you indeed, you know, see that people feel concern, feel compassion, feel empathy, and, and feel that they do need to act? Well, it's, it's an excellent question. And, 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 you know, I think if you'd asked me five months ago, I would have had a different answer, but it, it's, been, it's been pretty consistent. Basically, it's a brick wall <laughs> until people watch the film, frankly. And, and, then, and then it's different. And then, and then it's sort of the, the opposite of that. So I think you're right. There's a barrier there because of lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, because it is a country so far away, despite the fact that, you know, we're complicit in it with our tax dollars. People don't know the complex geopolitical dynamics of it because they are complex, right? And they are longstanding. Um, people don't know that the, you know, the Raytheon factory in Arizona, right, is killing children in Sana, right? Which we include that scene in the film, of course. But then what's been interesting is that, that once people watch the film, it flips, it flips 180. And then there's, there's been a pretty consistent and, and uh, abiding engagement with not only the film and the movement we're a part of to try to urge sort of a, uh, you know, a shift in, in the US government stance, but, but people engage personally. So you know, we've, um, uh, we've partnered with a bunch of civil society groups here in the US and other countries that are pushing really hard um, you know, the Friends Committee for National Legislation, the Yemeni Alliance Committee, um, the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation are all working on very different levels to apply pressure. And, um, and you know, we're hopeful that that pressure will continue to enact change, at least in governmental policy. So um, um, it, there's that brick wall and then we punch through it once sort of they experience, I think, the empathy of being in these clinics. And I, you know, I think you're right that it's images that move people. Uh, you know, I find that's one reason why I always <laughs> care as much about the images that run with my Yemen articles as with the text, because I know that it's those, you know, those photos or that video, whatever, that is really going to move people. But I also periodically get pushback from people who say, ah, oh, you know, that's poverty porn, things like this. And my... And I'm curious about how you, you know, deal with that issue. My, my response has been that, um, look, the, you know, the, the doctors and the parents are eager to have this footage shown because they don't want other children dying. And they know that these stories and these images will save lives and will move people in a way that... Um, something obscured or fuzzy uh, will not. And, um, but it's, um, so I mean, I, I find more, I find reservations about this in the US sometimes in a way that I did not.
about your your sense of that. Yeah, no, I I, I hear that a lot, um, and and it was it was certainly it's something that I um, I I'm very intentional about because because I am working in images primarily, right? And so it's something that um, that I think a lot about, um, and I have a lot of conversations about and that we're very careful about both during the filming process, but then also during post-production. And so the foundation for me and, and the starting point, frankly, is really just um, that foundation of trust that you have to build, right? Um, you have to, I mean, that's why we started communicating with Aida, doc, Dr. Al-Sadiq, and with Makia so long before we did the filming to sort of start that conversation early and get all their questions answered and, and you know, to make sure that they really wanted us there in the first place. And then within the clinics themselves, that's just a continuation of the same conversation, both with the healthcare workers, you know, and, um, and with the families themselves. And, and I, I, I was surprised at the sheer number of families that we collaborated with who expressed that same sentiment that you did, that, um, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive, I think, for an American to think that they would want any camera in a room when a child passes away. And as you saw in the film, that happened to us multiple times during the course of filming this, sadly. And it's the last thing we wanted to cover. It's the last thing we wanted to see or capture, frankly, but the families wanted us there. And when we talked to them after this really incredibly intimate family event unfolded and a child passed, um, in every instance, the, the family said, please, can you find a way to include this? You were here, you saw it, you have it in your camera, get it out to everyone because we want people to know. We want people to know that my child died and didn't have to because we couldn't get enough food for them. So it's a very real sentiment that, that I think lives to this day. And it's, it's horrific that that's the perspective, I think, that, that, um, that we need to live in. But until this changes, that's the reality. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think that they feel, and they may be right, that so many of these lost lives are unnecessary and so frustrating, but that if if that loss can be in a film that people watch around the U.S. and around the world, then that may give some meaning to, mm -hmm. to, to this young lost child and create some benefit that helps other children and saves their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, you know, I hope it, I hope it does. I hope that officials uh, watch and and feel uncomfortable as they, yeah. you know, as they make very difficult trade-offs. Um, I, I think, and, you know, I, th I think we're already seeing that to some degree. Mm -hmm. In terms of the, the Biden administration's pivot? Yeah, um, so actually in a couple of ways. I mean, I think you're seeing that in terms, I think we were already seeing that in terms of the Emiratis and the Saudis. So the Emiratis already, you know, they, they said, we're out of here. And um, there is indeed a wide belief that they still have, you know, some people in Yemen. But in general, I think they felt that their reputation was being tarnished by the war in Yemen uh, and wasn't really bringing them much. And so they largely pulled out earlier. Um, the Saudis, uh, and both the Saudis and the Emiratis are paradoxically providing a huge amount of, of assistance, uh, hunger assistance and, and aid to Yemen. And you know they always <laughs> make this point to me and say they should get more credit for all the lives they're saving. And you know my counter argument is, yes, you are genuinely saving a lot of lives, but that's only because you are putting those lives at risk earlier and you don't really get credit for saving lives that you endangered. Um, but uh, they've, you know, they have genuinely put in, uh, I, I think they're really worried about a, a huge full-blown famine um, this spring. And they have been pouring money into Yemen for that uh, reason. And then as you say, the Biden administration has um, taken action to 
they say stop the use of offensive weapon offensive weapons by Saudi Arabia in Yemen. Uh, I think they put more pressure on Saudi Arabia. I don't think that has gone far enough. At the end of the day, we have leverage over Saudi Arabia. They don't have leverage over us. Um, I think we should have made MBS pay for his murder uh, of Jamal Khashoggi um, rather than effectively let him walk. Um, and again, I think this is partly the same miscalculation of 2015 that we need the Saudis uh, to make the Iran deal work. And in 2021, it's some calculation that we need the Saudis to, to, to figure out how to get back in the Iran deal. And I think it was wrong in 2015. And I think it's fundamentally a miscalculation again today. Let's, let's, let's talk just a little bit in the, the little bit of time we have left here about the blockade, because um, you've probably been following the recent news on that. But, but just in short for, for listeners here, um, you know, one of the most damaging aspects of the current conflict is a blockade of the country, both at the, at the port city of Padeda in the west uh, and, and also over, over the airport in Sana, where I couldn't fly into. I actually had to fly into the south and then travel by road north because they, they had already shut down journalists and filmmakers getting in on the UN flights by then, probably because of you, Nick, because of all your stories. And so, um, so I, we flew in through Aden and then went north. Um, and, and that's, um, you know, that blockade, as you know, is causing an, an immense amount of suffering. And when we were in a hotel in Sana in the north, um, you know, there were so many chronic care medical patients there that were holed up in that hotel, just hoping and praying that the Saudis were going to allow a medical flight out because they kept promising it, right? And, and that, so that's a big push right now sort of politically to, for the U.S. to exert pressure to, to open this, this, the airport in Sana, as well as to allow the free flow of, of humanitarian aid as well as diesel through the Hidata port. Um, what are your thoughts on, 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 on whether that they're going to lift that blockade or whether the Biden administration is going to, to sort of unilaterally say to the Saudis, this needs to happen because of the current humanitarian cost? Do you think there's any chance of that? Um, so the Saudis have certainly become more, uh, I think the Saudis really are eager for a peace deal that would open up, uh, the port of Hodeida, that would open up the airport in Sana'a, that would basically end the quarantine, it would allow fishermen to go to sea. So I think the Saudis, uh, really would like to work out such a deal, um, but right now, the Houthis are being obstreperous uh, and um, are, as I understand it, part of an obstacle to that deal making. Um, I think that there is a deal to be done. Earlier, the Saudis were insisting that the Houthis would have to leave Sana and go up north again. That was just unrealistic. I think, I think that now there is enough pressure on the Saudis that uh, a deal can be done. Um, what I worry about though, Sky, is that Yemen has been so destroyed by six years of war that I'm just not sure that any government can really fully control all parts of the country. And, you know, that at least parts of it may end up being a little like Somalia, that it may be very hard to put Humpty Dumpty together again and to, and for aid workers to reach remote areas. Um, and... Uh, so it, um, you know, I, I guess, I guess I'm guardedly optimistic that uh, a, a deal can be done that will end the war, but can peaceful development and aid assistance be rendered around the country? I think that is going to be heavy lift. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll buy you a crystal ball for Christmas and send you a crystal ball. <laughs> Um, so, so to, uh, I think I want to close this with just a, a note of hope, maybe um, back to back to that theme a little bit. So, you know, what what can Americans do, right? What can we do as taxpayers, you know, to to intervene, to to assist this process um, of of ending what we saw in Hunger War, this human caused famine? What would you recommend for viewers? And then we have a couple action items that I'd like to toss out as well? Um, so I think 
that the two major points of vulnerability right now are uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I think that uh, letters to MBS or to the Saudi ambassador in Washington, um, you know, calling on them to lift the blockade uh, have, and I think they can amplify that pressure on Saudi Arabia. And I think pressure on President Biden and the State Department, uh, you know, through one's member of Congress, for example, can uh, make the Biden administration more willing to use its pressure and its leverage on Saudi Arabia to, to get that kind of deal. And, you know, it's true at the end of the day that we also need the Houthis to, to participate. But um, uh, if it's clear that the Saudis are willing to go there, then that creates more pressure on the, the Houthis. Um, so I think that there is a deal to be done that can save a lot of lives here, Sky. And um, my dog here, I'm on the family farm, so my dog is signaling canine agreement as well. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I do just want to mention briefly uh, that today the Friends Committee for National Legislation sent a letter to uh, the Biden administration actually signed by Mark Ruffalo, a lot of celebrities and different civil society groups urging further action to specifically lift the blockade. So you know, I think there's hope that there will be some traction there um, down the road. So um, Nick, I just, um, the deepest gratitude to you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to watch the film, to engage with us here and, and talk about a topic you, you know so much about. And I want to wish you um, the greatest of luck in your continued coverage of Yemen in the years to come, because I have a feeling that um, you're, you're not going to let go of this one. No, I won't. And, and thank you, Sky, for going there, for taking the risks uh, of, of, of covering that story. And thanks to everybody who's watching for engaging in a story that is a long way away, that may seem remote, but that involves a lot of lives that are at stake. And people can go to hungerward.org where we have a repository of both action items where people can engage with the senators and representatives and the Biden administration, as well as donate directly to the two clinics showcasing the film. So uh, thank you so much for everyone attending. And Nick, again, many thanks. <laughs>